No, we're back. back I know. What day? We're, so many days. We're missing someone. Someone, someone's on or we're missing someone i wonder if that's kenny because he was being a bit tricky behind <laughs> oh looks like someone's joining us oh 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 <laughs> <laughs> now we just missed rochelle i don't know what happened to rochelle she's just gone hey rochelle if you're there turn your camera and mic on <laughs> straight away but it doesn't look like she needs to come back in actually um anyway uh welcome to the cup of life cafe as rochelle comes back into the room uh, welcome everyone. Hey Amanda. Hey Tanya. Uh, welcome to the cover, Philip. Welcome back, Jill. Good to see you. The room's warming up. Um, please make sure you get take your virtual seat. Get comfy. I'm going to share with you our slides at the start. Uh, we are raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation. Sixteen thousand clubs are in trouble of shutting down due to COVID. Uh, that's that will probably get a lot higher now with everything that's happening down south of the border in Melbourne. Um, so we're thinking of you, all you Melbourne peeps out there. Um, so please make sure you do make raise some money for, sorry, make a donation to the Australian Sports Foundation. All funds are tax deductible. Uh, click on the office area right now and do make that donation. Uh, please play nice, be kind, get interactive, be involved, keep the conversation positive. And finally, please make sure you also tag us across all our social channels. Uh, make sure you tag our Daily Olympians as well. Uh, and Kerry, you might need to text Rochelle. <laughs> well, I actually think Rochelle might see us. Rochelle, if you're there, just log off and log back in again. So, uh, yeah, try that. How are you, see. Ken? You good? <laughs> I'm a little nervous now that I've lost Rochelle. <laughs> yeah, what have you done, Ken? You were doing all this magic before we started, and now you've just like made her disappear. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. She'll just appear ready in now. <laughs> Well, everyone, welcome back. Um, we're so excited to see you again. It's great to see familiar faces in the chat room. Hi, everyone. I know there's a lot of people who have been watching and they're not saying anything. So tonight's the night. If you want to get involved in the conversation, put some comments in there, ask some questions of Kenny and Rochelle when we get her back. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Shall I send her a message? Yeah, to... send her a quick message. You keep going. Oh, I'll just chat to Ken. <laughs> where, where are you based, bro? The goalie, Gold Coast. Gold Coast. No COVID you know, there. You shut the border. None of us can get in. No, nah, no one's allowed in. We're, we're done. It's funny how many people wanted that border open. It was all about getting the border open, getting the border open, and now it's all about shut it, shut it quick, shut it. <laughs> well, let's hope, let's hope, I was just going to say let's hope that things stay as they are and Melbourne just keeps on, the curve goes down and, you know, we can keep enjoying our freedoms and our life because, yeah, life is interesting right now and it's exactly why we put this series together, Ken. It's called The Athlete Story, powered by Luke's Cup of Life Cafe and we just really want to tell stories um, and get you guys to share, you know, your journeys with Australia and with the world um, during the time that the Olympics would have been on. So as everyone knows, the Olympics, this would have been day 13 of the Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo. So today we would have seen medals in your sport, Ken, but we also would have seen the women's gold medal hockey match. So that's why we've got yourself and Rochelle in tonight. Well, Rochelle is there somewhere when you decide to bring her back with a <laughs> She's coming. She just got your message. She the room. She'll, be there. Yeah. she'll be back in a sec. Ken, we'll start with you, shall we? Oh, I don't know. That's not her. That's Luke going. We'll start with you. Um, now, three Olympic Games. 2008, 2012, 2016, in the sport of canoeing or kayaking. What is the name of the sport? Because you're in a kayak, but it's called canoeing. Yeah, so the official name is canoe kayak. Right. But uh, that we kind of, we're lucky. We've got two sports kind of, or two kind of sports within the one sport. So canoeing is what you're up on one knee and you, you've got one blade and you, you're going down the side. And kayaking is you sit in a tiny little boat and you've got two paddles. My little sister will be the first uh, woman for Australia. She's actually going to Tokyo next year competing in canoeing as well. So, um, yeah, quite proud of her and, and she'll be there. But she's the canoe part and I'm the kayak part. Ah, is there a bit of rivalry in the family? At the dinner table, there always was. <laughs> uh, we've got an older sister as well, so I'm, I'm the middle child. But, um, yeah, there was always that competition in, in our family. I, I grew up... Um, following my older sister around she was a swimmer and so I always just grew up around the swimming pool 
And then my little sister, she just kind of did anything that we did, including a couple of other random sports like ice skating and a few other bits and pieces. But now she's ice skating. On, ice skating on the Gold Coast. Yeah, I think it's a tourist attraction in Surface Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> How cool. Well, you made history in 2008 when you won gold and, and bronze to become the Australia's most successful male Olympian at the Beijing Games. You won gold in 08 in the K1500 and bronze in the K1000. And then you picked up the bronze a couple of Olympics later in the K2 1000 in Rio. You've also got multiple world championships. Um, when... Like when we think of what's going on right now, I know like big question is, are you going towards Tokyo? Because I know you did plan on it, but where are you at right now? And so a lot changed for me between 2012 and 2016, which to me I think were my most successful years. Even though I'd won a couple of Olympic medals earlier on in my career, I still think between 2012 and 2016 was my most successful. And part of that was... I had my first two children within that period of time. And then I've also had a third, a little 18-month-old little girl now. So I've got two boys and a girl. And after Rio Olympics, I was all hell-bent. You know what? I'm going to go for four Olympic Games. I'm happy with what I was, where I am at the moment in life, but I'm just going to keep going. And as the kids started to get a little bit older and a little bit, I wanted to be around them a lot more than what I am and uh, with something that will come up probably later on tonight but to be good in your sport and to be great at that level you need to be obsessed you need to mm. you need to live it and breathe it and be a hundred percent immersed in it and you dot the I's cross the T's get the physio done get the weights done get the recovery done get, and I just simply wasn't obsessed with my sport anymore I was obsessed obsessed with my children and my family and that's when I started to go well I'm actually really quite content with the results and and where I am in the sport and I'm not content with my family because I want to spend more time sorry not content with my family I'm not content with myself that I want to spend more time with my family and that's kind of when I thought all right that's I'm ending my I'm getting towards the end of my career I probably will never say that I'm retired um, because I don't think any athlete ever really is retired, at least not from either talking about it or, or mm. still. Because I love the sport and I'm probably one of the only, not the only athlete, I'm probably one of the athletes that actually still enjoys my sport after they're finished. Uh, so I'm still I'm still paddling, I'm still training, I'm still training quite a bit actually. I don't know. Don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what are you training for? But training for the love of it. And that's probably why, you know, in all the years that you've been involved in the sport, you've done so well and you've stayed at the top because you love it. And with all the athletes we've been talking to in this series, it's, you know, and Dawn, I think, said it on the second or third night we had um, with her. She said, just have fun. You know, you just got to love what you do. And that's exactly what kept me in volleyball as well. Welcome back, Rochelle. Hi, Terry. Glad to be here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sometimes we have gremlins. I don't know if the video sets them off, but yeah, logging back out and logging back in is the best thing that we can do to get you back in the room. So everybody, Rochelle Hawks, captain of the Australian hockey team, the Hockey Roos for eight years, competed in four Olympic Games, becoming only the second Australian woman after Dawn Fraser to win three gold medals in three different games. So in 88, 96 and 2000 in Sydney. And in fact, Rochelle, yourself, Dawn, Andrew Hoy, who we've had on, James Tompkins, who we've had on, you guys are the only Aussies ever to achieve that feat. So we're really, really honoured to have you on tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kerry. And you have the most caps, 279 international matches. Does that record still stand? It doesn't stand anymore. It oh. uh, stood for a while, but uh, Nikki... Hudson, um, formerly known as Nikki Mott, she surpassed uh, those. She was the first after me to surpass the, that number of international games and go on to play 300 and something. And there's been a couple more since then. So held the record for a little while. But, um, yeah, there's been a few hockey roos that have come and, and surpassed that um, 279 mark. 
Well, your team was a well-oiled machine and um, you girls just did amazing over, you know, more than a decade. And we'll talk about that in a sec, but guys, where would you have been had Tokyo been on right now? I've asked all my, my uh, athletes this question. First up, where would you have been if the, if the Olympics would have been on? Would you be home watching it on the couch? Would you be over there? Would you be commentating? Rochelle, where would you have been? Oh, for the first time, I've been really fortunate, Kerry, at, like yourself, to have commentated a few Olympic Games and I've been to every one since um, Athens uh, right the way through to London and Rio in 2016. So this time I would have been on the couch uh, watching the Australian athletes do their thing and spectacularly um, perform, I, I was hoping anyway. So now we've got to wait another year. But I think, um, you know, for some athletes, it's going to all go very well. They'll get over injuries and be able to break their way into the team or selection. And, and for others, you know, sadly, that it might not be the same result. That might be age that uh, means that they can't go on that journey or, or it might be injury. So it's going to be a really fascinating uh, Tokyo next year and how that all plays out. I think it will be riveting stuff. So I'll be on the couch watching it. Yeah, with a nice cold iced tea. <laughs> hey, Ken, where do you think you'll be now that you've decided to hang up your, your paddle? Yeah, I, I'll, still, I'll still be in Tokyo. You will be? Be, What's the plan? I'll be, I'll be there uh, supporting my little sister. She was there at my Olympic Games and I'll be there watching her compete for sure. Um, there was talks of doing bits and pieces in and around the Olympic team and the Olympic space and, and mentoring and ambassador stuff. But uh, to be honest, I'd be happy just to be there and experience a different side of the Olympic Games um, you know, from the grandstands and to be there to be 100% there for my little sister. Yeah, awesome. It certainly is a, a really cool transition when you go to an Olympics like Rochelle and I have and you go there not as an athlete and you all of a sudden see what the Olympics is all about, you know, hearing it, feeling it, hey? I'd be a little scared, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're not in that bubble anymore. And I'm sure that, you know, either the networks or, you know, your sport will be, you know, drawing on your experience to be involved. So, yeah. Let your family know that you won't be around for those 17 days. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And Rochelle, you were introduced to hockey quite early. I mean, you're probably the earliest of all the athletes I've spoken to at the age of six. How did that come about? Well, we lived in a number of country towns and one of those was Wandawi, which is about an hour northeast of Perth in Western Australia. And um, we lived there and they didn't have a hockey association, they didn't have teams. And my mother actually started up the Hockey Association for Juniors in Wandawi and that's how it all evolved. And we played on um, clay, muddy pitches, hardly any grass on top of them. Um, so you could really hone your skills because it was like flat and it was hard and it was difficult to play on. So from there uh, we moved to Northern, which is only half an hour up the road. And mum became president of the Hockey Association. She was, she ended up being a technical director in hockey, a manager, you name it. So she was heavily involved. So that really influenced me to then get into hockey. I played a number of sports when I lived in the country and Northern played everything from softball to squash, to basketball, to tennis. But it was hockey that kept drawing me in and, and I just followed that path and went from country sport into the city and then through the ranks. And it was obviously, um, for most athletes, a very up and down journey and that was to be the same for me. Well, 15 years you stayed at the top of your game, you know, playing for Australia. What do you think drove you throughout that time? Was it the competition? Was it the training? Was it just like competition within yourself to see how far you could get? I think a bit of both, Kerry, in terms of competition. Competition within myself, just a really extremely competitive person. And then the thrill of competing 
against the best nations in the world in your sport just gave me a real buzz. So having that competitive edge and that real internal drive, they were the key factors for me and just helped me to continue in the sport and keep playing for 15 years because at times, and I think most athletes will attest to this, your motivation is up and down. Sometimes it's at an all-time high when you're competing in front of 10, 15,000 people in a, in a stadium. And then other times when we played in Windy Wellington, there's about one supporter in the crowd, the motivation isn't quite so high. So having that internal competitiveness and that drive to, to want to be the best and compete against the best in the world, that's what drove me for those 15 years. Yeah, and always having that um, goalpost of the next quad, you know, the next Olympics or the next World Championships and having something to aim for is so important, especially now with what's going on in this world, you know, with all the uncertainty, just it's almost like you can't think too far ahead. You have to have those smaller, shorter goals. And But just having something to work towards, I think, is so important. Ken, when did you first start on the water? Because I think you started on the sand as a clubby, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I didn't. I started off in the swimming pool, to be honest. So okay. I was under, under the water, <laughs> not on top of the water. Um, and I always thought that I'd go to the Olympics for swimming. That was it. That was always the dream. I was five, six years old, and, that, and that's all I wanted to do. I was chasing my older sister around the swimming pool, and she made a couple of young Australian teams. And, and then uh, that's when I lived down uh sydney way on the central coast and then we moved to the gold coast and where we moved to um my older sister was uh training with laurie lawrence and so was i at the time and she well we moved we lived near the beach or on the beach at talabudra and i saw nippers there one day and i thought oh that looks cool you know can i go down and join in and when i asked i said yeah yeah it's our age it's our club championships or something I went, okay cool when there, I'd won the swim. I went, oh yeah, that's all right, because I could, knew I could swim. But then I won the board race. I'd won the Ironman race. I went, oh, how good is this? <laughs> Don't even know what this sport is, and I'm winning. So, and then all of a sudden, I didn't lose the dream to go in the Olympics, but the focus had kind of shifted, and I wanted to be an Ironman. I wanted to be Kellex Nutrigran and the Uncle Toby's Ironman. And so I, I did that. I still continued to swim because if you're a good swimmer doing Ironman, then Iron Man's a lot easier, obviously. Um, Don't tell Guy Leach that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier if you can swim. And so I, I went on and I raced in Kellogg's for a couple of years. And um, it wasn't until I watched, uh, I started kayaking in 20 or 2000. I was 16 years old. Um, I turned up to nationals like three months after I'd first sat in a kayak. And the same thing happened. I went, I just kind of won everything. I won the 500, the 1,000, the 2.5K. I went, oh, how good is this sport? Don't even know what it is, and I'm winning. So, And it was my sheer, just fitness from my swimming and, and Ironman background that got me through. Um, a year later, I went overseas in the Australian team, and I went to world championships or junior worlds, and I'd won world championships. I thought, oh, that's cool. Don't really know what the sport is too much. And I, I saw it in Sydney at the time as well and i thought okay that's what it is and um i probably didn't really give it the satisfaction or didn't really give it the credit for winning world championships at the time just because i didn't really put too much effort into it it sounds a little bit cocky but that's how it was at the time um and so i was still hell-bent on being an iron man i still wanted to be an iron man and it wasn't until athens olympics that i was sitting on the couch and i saw on tv there was people in the final at athens that i knew i could beat like i'd beaten them in previous years and they were in the final at the olympic games i went all right time to pull my finger out and get my ass in the gear and and uh 2005 came along and i and i put my head down and kind of went for it um and so it was like three years later uh yeah we got to start at the olympic games through uh, a lot a few different qualifying races and so forth and yeah, that's when it went on, so kicked on. I think your body type just in that photo is quite attuned to be a paddler. Uh, to yeah, play, not, to get to the gun show there, bro. Look at that, <laughs> hey? <laughs> yeah, that's what I look like now, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking, too, when you said you went down the beach and you saw the nippers, what if you'd seen a beach volleyball court? 
I wonder how different yeah. your life would be. You, you never know. Like, it, and it's something that we we talk about with young kids at the moment. That's that like our talent pool for kayaking all comes from surf life saving or swimming majority of the time, but it does come from other sports as well. And we're finding now that just because you do one sport now doesn't mean that you're not going to be good at something else mm. because it's simply you know how to train, you know how to race, you know how to compete, and it's just simply a talent transfer. Like it's obviously easier to go from water to water sports and then land to land sports, but uh, yeah, that talent transfer we're finding that it's happening quite a fair bit now. So who knows? I maybe could have done volleyball, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well, we heard we heard that talent transfer with um, Tom Slingsby he was a professional tennis player, and then yeah. went into sailing. Um, I think Kim Brennan as well from um, uh, I'm not sure which sport. I think athletics to to rowing. Like it, yeah. it happens. It does happen. So yeah, good good point with kids. Sometimes we think once you lock in a sport, that's it forever. Um, but Rochelle, early on in your career, you had some issues with um, compartment syndrome in your legs. Can you share with us what happened there? Sure. Yeah, so it affected my calf muscle area, as you alluded to, Kerry, and um, it affected my anterior and perineal compartments, which are on the sides, the anterior at the front, the perineals on the side. And it took quite a lot of um, effort to find out, get the diagnosis, what was wrong with me. And I remember getting into the team in 1985, long time, long time ago. And, um, you know, being 18 and sort of fumbling through it and not really asserting myself in the team. And then sort of within sort of 12 months of heavy training, I was in the Australian Institute of Sport in Western Australia because it was a decentralised program and I started to feel really uncomfortable in the legs. So it's like a cramping sensation. Your legs are really heavy and you can't sprint. It's like you're jogging on the spot. And I was sort of pushing through it, wanting to stay in the Australian team, but I was only staying in there by the skin of my teeth. And I was going and often getting tests and for shin splints and all sorts of other ailments. And then I went to a specialist um, uh, who specialised in this kind of injury and um, what he'd do is he'd send me out on runs and you'd have to go on a run for 20 or 30 minutes and hopefully hope that your legs would flare up. And with me, uh, it didn't always flare up. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. So it was extremely frustrating. So what they did, well, I'd go off for a run and if my legs did flare up, they'd stick a big needle into the compartment and it was it was about this long and they'd stick it in and they'd measure the pressure readings in your leg and normal's about 25 and mine ended up being 55 and a lot of athletes who chronic um, compartment syndrome they have readings up to 80 85 so I was sort of in the the mid range and so then and there they decided to um, decided to give me a fasciotomy and so I went to hospital, had that operation, and that was on the anterior compartments. So I then managed to sort of forge my way back into the Australian team, but I was still having trouble. And it wasn't until post 88 Olympics, I managed to stay in that team just. And after 88, I said, I've, I've just got to get this fixed. So I went back home, had another operation on my legs, on the perineals on the side. And that seemed to fix the problem. And from then on, sort of 89 onwards, it was um, onwards and upwards and was able to become a more integral part of the team. So, yeah, it was trying times for quite a few years but managed to overcome it. Yeah, the things we do for the love of sport. You know, I had the, I've had six knee surgeries now, but I, I completely smashed my my right knee and moved to Perth actually to try and get back into the indoor national team. And you know, eventually, I just wanted to keep playing, and I kept pushing my body, and then got into beach volleyball. It turned out pretty good, but you know, still you push your body, and you're you're left with a a lot of uh, leftover injuries, I guess. So, um. Can you, in 2006, you had a fellow competitor who um, had a, he was banned from sport with some drug taking issues and that gave you an opportunity, like the door opened for you basically at that point. Yeah, so that happened in 2005 um, and in 2006 was the first time that I raced K1 at a senior level other than a World Cup, I raced at World Championships. 
Um, and it was, I ma and somehow made the final in 2006 and I got through and I got fifth. And the guys in front of me, every single one of them was, well, three of them were Olympic champions and one of them got silver at the Olympics and I was the fifth place getter. Um, and they got two guys behind me also won medals at the Olympics. That's when I went, ooh, hold on a sec. Because I always thought, oh, I'm a little bit too young for bashing. You know, London will be, I'll be at the right age because, you know, our sport was always based around strength. And I kind of thought oh, I'll have that man strength, you know, in, in London. And I got sixth, uh, yeah, no, fifth, sorry, in 2006, got fifth. And I thought, all right, sweet. The following year, a lot of people think that Australia just gets a start at the Olympic Games. That's not true in our sport. We have to qualify. Um, and in the K1, you have to get in the top eight at World Championships. In the single, in the K2, the two-man, you have got to get top six as well. And then K4, the top six. Either way, I just wanted to prove to myself that it, you know, the year before wasn't a fluke. And so I'd gone from fifth to fourth. And then, yeah, elite... I'd qualified the boat for the Olympic Games. Um, which, again, I only qualified the boat. You don't actually don't qualify yourself. And then the year after, I had to come home and race one of my idols and the guy that I'd look up to uh, was Clint Robinson. That you'd know quite well. And mm. I had to race against him. And he hadn't raced all season or all year. And he was just turning up for the Olympic trials. And uh, even still to this day, that's probably one of the most nervous races I've ever done because uh, I was racing a legend of the sport, you know, an Olympic champion himself. And we'd come down the course. He was in front of us the whole way up until the last 30 metres, and I'd got him by like 0.3 of a second. And he turned around after the race. And, and this is the part that makes me respect him even more. Yeah, he came come up and he was congratulating me and telling me how, how good a race it was. And effectively, I just pulled, pushed him out of that K1 spot you know, the spot wow. I was gunning for. And, and yet he was still coming back at me and saying how good a race I did. And he also turned around and said that was his best time he'd ever done. Wow. So that's quite amazing that I'd beaten my hero and legend at, you know, and he'd done his best time and I'd just beaten him. So, yeah, that was, that was kind of the lead up. That all happened just before Beijing. Yeah, pretty awesome, Tick. What an inspiration for you for that to happen right there. You know, anything could have happened in that race, but for that to happen, giving you the confidence and the belief, because we hear a lot about athletes, you know, being so full of belief, so certain when they go into their races or their, their games, you know, for the finals, that, you know, they've built that up. But you had that from Clint. That's pretty cool. What a great story. Um, Rochelle, 1988, you won Australia's first gold. Now, four years later... You guys, well, even three years later, you won the Champions Trophy. Then you had the Olympics in 92. Then you won the Champions Trophy again. So obviously 92 didn't go so well. What actually happened? Why do you think the team didn't do well in 92? Because I think you lost to the host nation. That would have been pretty scary. Yeah, so looking back on it, uh, we had a, a team in 88 for, you know, the four years leading into that and then post 88 that... Um, was a good team and coached reasonably well, but he had more a, a managerial style, if you like. So we lacked sort of the continuous improvement that we then found under Rick Charlesworth's tutelage. And that was sort of, for me, some of the, the fundamental differences between 88 92 and then leading into 96 and 2000 which were the halcyon years for the hockey Roos between 93 and 2000 so it was very much about the leadership at the helm and then what we had from post 92 right the way to 2000 was a core group of players about eight to ten players that moved from the um, 1992 um, barcelona games right the way through to sydney 2000 so the coaching, the leadership, the um, core group of players that move through the system and then our training regime under Rick was a lot more intense 
we went a professional for the first time in 1996. We were full-time hockey players. So there were a lot of differences. Mm. And, and some of the fundamental reasons why we didn't do well in 92, we did okay in 88. And then if you've got sort of this managerial style of leadership, then you, you don't have that continuous improvement and you get some wins, but you're very up and down. Mm. Whereas, you know, the moving forward from 93 to through to Sydney 2000, we had continuous steady improvement. So it was very much about an inspirational leadership style. And in 88, we won gold, yes, and we played reasonably well in the lead up. But again, we were up and down, ranked number one at times, fell down. We, we finished sixth in a World Cup tournament and then got to 1992. We were expected to do really well. We'd been ranked highly going into that tournament. We were fatigued. We All we did really in the preparation was a lot of running, repetitive sort of training regime. And so the team performed really poorly at that Olympic Games. It was actually, as you alluded to, beaten by Spain, who went on to win the gold medal, which was very unexpected. So, yeah, the differences in the way the, tr the team was trained, the core group that we had that moved through the system and um, our leadership were some of the key areas for our success. Yeah, well, um, Rick was described as being famous for his innovative tactics on the field and his Svengali-like motivational powers off it. Um, what was your relationship like with Rick being the captain? How did you guys gel together to lead the team? Well, I, I guess on reflection, um, my leadership probably could have been better, but um, you, you certainly don't, you don't study leadership. Um, it's sort of thrust upon you and they sort of look at you as perhaps a potential leader within the group. So I was leader of the team from 1993. He anointed me as captain. And what happened post that was um, 1995, we went to a co-captaincy arrangement and then we brought a, a number of um, additional leaders in to the group around six to eight and then by 1999 we he he approached me and said I want to chat to you about the leadership we went and had a coffee and he said I want to go to a leaderful team I think that the captaincy model is an outdated philosophy and I really believe that everyone should be a self-starter and they should take responsibility for leadership on the field internally and so that's what we that's what we did. We went basically from sole captain to a co-captaincy arrangement to a, a group of leaders and then eventually a leaderful team. I didn't necessarily agree with uh, that approach and um, then what we found post Sydney was a lot of teams adopted the co-captaincy philosophy and they've sort of reverted back to this um, single captaincy. No one's really adopted in team sport a leaderful team approach and I, I can't seem to find any team around the world that has adopted that approach but that was his philosophy at that time and we had a very tempestuous relationship it was very up and down it was a love-hate relationship I have to admit that he saw a lot of weaknesses in me I saw some weaknesses in him very difficult and challenging man but at, at, at the same time an inspiring leader as well and I think you know, on reflection, that's the hallmark, I think, of great leadership. You're not going to have everyone love you. You're not going to have all the skills and attributes that people say makes a great leader. You are going to have your failings, and I think that's really important to note that you're not going to have, you're not going to be the total package. You're going to have skills that are really good for a leadership role but there's some things that you need to work on and that's why you surround yourself with good people and Rick did that and that's what the team did as well we had other great people within our group who could lead in different areas and that might be in a mentorship role with the players in the team or it might have been from a strategic point of view so everyone has their different attributes and and that's what we had in our team and that made us very successful. And your team had a really special word that you I've heard you use before um, that I'm not sure if Rick came up with this or you guys did, Kzen. 
Um, yeah, ka yeah, Kaizen, which is a Japanese word, which meant continual improvement, and that was very much our focus. And Rick and the coaching staff came up with that word, and we used a lot of quotes along the way, and there was a lot of learnings that we had, not only for sport, but it was life skills as well. Mm. So for that, I am really grateful we took a lot of those learnings into your life post sport and during of course but when you go in business or even in family life and you're not always perfect but you can reflect on some of those learnings and and make some adjustments and some changes as you need to yeah 100 percent. i'm sure ken would agree that you know uh, a successful athlete is not just physical um it is also a very um well developed athlete mentally you know attitude wise mindset and everything like that ken in london 2012 Speaking of um, things other than sport, you didn't get the medal you were after, but you did get something else. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, no, so I got, no, I, I got the wooden medal. I got fourth. <laughs> yeah, so, the potato medal. That's what Natalie calls it. But, but you, know, you know what you do get for fourth? It's something special, a participation certificate. You <laughs> really? <can play> that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, I was, I was quite happy. You know, that at the time, I was... I was so disappointed and so, uh, yeah, utterly disappointed with fourth place. And now I look back on it and I go, actually, no, fourth's not bad at the Olympic Games. Uh, and I've now got two, two fourth places too. So, but um, something else, up, though. something straight, else. Straight after the race, yeah, I took uh, my girlfriend at the time who had been going out for quite a while. We'd, I took her for a bike ride up the course sitting on the handlebars and I had proposed to her at the thousand meter mark at the start <laughs> where we start the race normally. Um, so yeah, that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. I'm sure all the, the female viewers tonight would yeah. uh, be yeah. giving you a little clap, a little silent clap there. And I think I also read that you wore your, the engagement ring um, on a necklace during the final. Yeah. Maybe you were pre <laughs> a little bit too early that she was going to say yes. You're a bit distracted. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I'd ha kind of had a plan, which uh, which was kind of cool. I'd spend months overseas leading into it, and I'd already already knew what ring I was getting there and everything else. And it's funny, I, I asked my parents to go pick it up for me and and so forth, and they brought it over and and then yeah, wore it around the neck on a on a little necklace whilst I was racing, and then straight after the race, yeah, proposed it. So didn't come home with a medal, came home with a wife though. Yeah, much better than a medal. <laughs> well done, Kitty. Well which, done. Which was sensational. I think I'd swap all my medals for her. <laughs> oh, oh, let's all just guess, have a moment. That's so you are nailing this, bro. You are absolutely <laughs> nailing that. that is epic. My wife's, my wife's watching as well, so I'm in trouble. See you later, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to ask Rochelle a question that you just wrote in the chat box. I saw there, Ken. You wanted to ask us if she was nervous. So, um, to let everyone know, in Sydney 2000, Rochelle, you were asked to read the Olympic Athlete's Oath um, in front of a packed stadium of 110,000 people, um, 10,000 athletes just waiting and, and, like, staring and glaring at you from all over the world, you know, right in front of you and about 3 billion people watching on TV. Tell us how you felt in the lead-up to that. Well, I think I felt more nervous doing that than I did playing the games throughout the tournament and the, the gold medal playoff because what happened was in the lead up to that, behind the scenes, there was a fair bit that went on. And I was called up to John Coates's office, the chef de mission of the Australian Olympic team, and he brought me up to the office and said to me, Andrew Gaze will be the flag bearer. I would love you to read the athlete's oath. And I was, oh, wow, that's amazing. Of course I will. And he said, whatever you do, keep it a secret for 24 hours. Oh. So I thought, well, that's going to be pretty difficult for a female because we <laughs> tend to be known as the gossipers. And Andrew Gaze was also told he would be the flag bearer. So the next day was the flag raising ceremony. And post the flag raising ceremony, there was a, media conference and it was announced and what I didn't know was Andrew was told to keep a secret but he went straight back to his basketball team and told them everything the, the day before and I was sworn to secrecy I didn't tell anyone 
And so it was announced that uh, yeah, I'd be the oath reader and Andrew be the flag bearer and his team looked really surprised, but they really weren't. And I, I remember a reporter coming up to me and saying, well, did you know in 1984, Edwin Moses got halfway through the oath and forgot his lines and said, could the same thing happen to you? And I remember it vividly. And then the pressure started to mount and everyone says, oh, you know, there's gonna be a few billion people watching you. And then the worst part of all, was Rick being the ultimate professional. He said, oh, so proud of you, really great. He said, but in three days' time, I'm coming to your room and you need to recite the oath to me. And I, that was more pressure than I felt playing hockey. And sure enough, three days later, knock on the door, he turns up and I have to recite the oath to him. And I was hopeless. I said, Rick, I think I can do it in front of three billion people go away, let me let me do this and, and uh, manage to deliver on the night. But it was a very scary time. I was getting a massage in the basketball stadium as, you know, you wait there as the host country, you're last to come out and I was getting a massage and Andrew was there and he had to just carry the flag. So everyone's giving him a high five and he's as happy as Larry and I'm just sweats pouring off me and finally got to, the, to, to deliver the oath and one of the proudest moments, very, very humbling experience. Now, if, Rochelle, what, what were you looking at in, in that photo? In that yeah. photo what, what were you looking at? Were you looking at just a, a crowd, like a, a space of people, or were you focused on something or a camera or what, what was it? I looked above the crowd because the hockey team, was right at the front, <laughs> front of stage, and I knew if I looked at them, I would lose it. So I looked above them to the back of the grandstand, sort of a central point, and delivered it. And I'd been told by friends, they said, whatever you do, read it, because if you try and recite it from memory, you might go down the same path as others. So I made sure I read it, and it was extremely nerve-wracking, but got through it. Well, uh, I would have thought picturing 110,000 people naked would have been pretty. Yeah, pretty you would have done that, Kenny. You would have <laughs> done that. Well, I watched it today and you didn't read it because you had those, you know, had that little card uh, and it was so tiny. I'm like, there's no way you would have fit every single word on that little card, right? Because you kind of looked down, I think, twice, but the rest you were looking straight ahead. What was on the little card? Yeah, so the, the so Kerry, the oath was written on that card, and oh, wow. um, yeah, yeah. So I was given that card, and that sits in the um, Melbourne Museum. There's the oath, and a photo, and a letter from John Landy, who read the oath at the '56 uh, oh. Olympic Games in Melbourne, and I'm I was so chuffed to receive that letter from him. It was a beautiful letter, and just a beautifully spoken man and, and his sportsmanship in Australian sport is second to none. So it was a really moving moment for me to, to have that, that oath and then um, put it into a frame and, and send it off to the museum in Melbourne and it just brings back just wonderful memories. Yeah, well, you obviously, you did a great job, did a great job reading that oath. It was just absolutely perfect. And then you went on and you did a great job. And I was at your gold medal match in Sydney. It, it was just after Natalie and I had won. We'd done the media circus for a few days. And then we, we luckily we got some tickets and we rushed to your game. The whole time, Rochelle, I couldn't watch your game because people were asking for autographs. <laughs> we were just like... We were just completely, um, you know, crowded with people, like taking photos and autographs. So I barely got to see your game, um, but yeah, it was a it was a special day, obviously. Um, Kenny Rio, 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 Rio it was pretty special for you because you had your family there, including your mum and your sister. So tell us what the difference, what it's like when you have your whole family there compared to when you're on your own. No. I had my I was lucky enough to I had my family there at, at all the Olympic Games. It's just oh, that family, right. yeah, it's just that uh, my family had grown yes. in 2012 and 2016, and so I yeah having my kids there and watch me come down the course. Like every morning I'd go there to race. We raced in the second week, so didn't really get to see too much of them. I saw glimpses of them the week before and. 
and my wife's really good at she knows we're we're there for a job and we're there for a reason that's what we're there to do so she's not trying to drag me away or do anything else or thing else she's actually pushing me away going go away do do your thing and um but she's she's turned up she's traveled to rio with two kids and and having them that's there sort of, every, every morning what... after yeah i'd do go out and do my warm-up and then i'd kind of sneak in where i'm not meant to run off the podium and then run up to the grandstand give them a kiss and and then go go off and race but each time after each race i'd come in I'd pull at least one of the kids out over the grandstand and take them through all the media scrum and everything else and took them into all the athletes area that you're not meant to take them to. And, um, yeah, that I loved it. That, it was great. And now I look back and I know that they do too, because my oldest one now, he's asking a lot more questions and, and so forth. And he's got all this video and, and his footage that's there. Um, just by coincidence, I don't, didn't have this. It's upside down. But it's hard to see. But there's a couple of handprints on the paddle. Oh yeah, so, see that. Yeah, might be a bit hard to see, but no, we can see that. It's upside down, obviously. If I do that one, but yeah. um, yeah, that was before the race. Uh, there was a little pen there that somebody had me sign in something, and I went, "Oh, this sounds like a good. This seems like a good idea." And grabbed my kids' handprints and, and outlined them. I thought, "Oh, that's cool. They can give me a hand coming down the course." And yeah, so Rio was special for me in that way. Every Olympics that I that I'd gone to, there was a different sort of inspiration or different reasoning behind it. Beijing was all about you know going there, doing it, winning. Mm. all there for yourself and your family and your friends everything but it was so focused on it london was oh now i need to replicate what i just did <laughs> and so it had this different you know reasoning behind it and then rio was more yeah you know, i've got my family there i want to show them the olympic ideals and, and what it's like to go to an olympic games and hopefully one day they they look at the photos and they go oh my dad you know i can say him that tell them Oh look! I used to be really cool. Uh, this, uh... <laughs> well, that, we'll look at those photos, especially that one of your daughter holding the medal and just looking at it, going, "Wow, <laughs> you know, that's so cool." There's um, on the special that Channel Seven had the other night, right in the closing um, video, there was a picture of my niece who would have been about, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of guessing six or seven, and she was holding up her finger and she was just like <laughs> crying, going. <gasps> like this and it was just like wow and she's in her 20s now and she can look back at that and go wow yeah i was there so your kids are going to do that in 10 15 20 years for the rest of their life they're going to be able to say that yeah that that's i hope so and i, I hope i've somehow like every parent you hope that you've taught them something along those lines like you know the respect for that i have for athletes because i'm quite really good mates with everybody else that's on the podium mm -hmm. and there's photos in my house with everyone else and they I go around and go, oh, look, there's Adam and there's Tim. And they go go around. And my youngest son on the way to school some mornings in the car, he, he rings up Adam, the guy that got <laughs> silver to me in Beijing. Get, he's in Canada. He's a federal minister in Canada, Canada now. But he calls him on the FaceTime. Hey, Adam, how are you? And, yeah, my son's seven years old. And Adam answers back, hey, Nixon. So yeah, it's pretty oh. cool to have that sort of relationship with your other athletes and you can show that, yeah, it's not all about racing. It's about the yeah. friends that you can create and so much more. Yeah, I think um, many athletes are very fortunate that if they have had kids, it doesn't happen much for females, more for males. But I have a friend, her name is Kerry. She's won three Olympic golds in beach volleyball after Natalie and I won. And she had three kids and three gold medals all kind of one at a time. One gold, one kid, two goals, two kids. <laughs> yeah. Goals, three kids so uh yeah they, they need one each yeah well she's going for her oh god i don't even know sixth olympics because she played indoor in sydney before she played beach so she's an absolute freak she's in her 40s and still going um guys i want to ask you both you, you've talked a lot about the olympics and how special it is but what does it really mean in here to you to be an olympian because we're not ex-olympians we're not former olympians we are Olympians. So maybe, Rochelle, start with you. What does it mean to you deep inside? I think you're in an elite club. I think it's something like only 1% of the population get to go to an Olympic Games. So it's a very fortunate position to be in. 
and you're competing against against the best of the best. So I think from that point of view, being able to climb the pinnacle of your sport and go to an Olympic Games, be fortunate enough to go to one or more and win a gold medal, silver or bronze or just compete, I think it's just the ultimate, you know, in sport and I still view it as the biggest sporting event in the world. And I agree with you, you're not a former Olympian, you're always an Olympian and you've joined an elite small club and it's something that we should all cherish. Yeah, amazing. What about you, Ken? Can you top that? <laughs> I, I don't think I can. I, I think I'll uh, say exactly the same thing. But I think the we change our interpretation of, of being Olympian as as we get older and as as we go through life like at my first olympic games i didn't really to be honest with you, i didn't really think about any of that i just mm. wanted to go there and win and that was and and that's the olympic games was something different and then go to your second one or go to your third one or, or you just simply just get older and you start reflecting back on on what you've actually right. achieved and that's when you go oh I, I am part of this club i am part of the these people and I look around and there's still so many Olympians and, and we've seen so many of them on, on this webinar with Couple Life. It was, I look, oh, those, those guys are my heroes. That's my idols. And, and there's guys I look up to so much. And it, it's, I still don't put myself into those categories, even though I'd go, oh, yeah, I've got three Olympic medals and they've got three Olympic medals or four Olympic medals. Yeah, whatever it is, I look at them and go, oh, those guys are my heroes. Like I still look up to them and I kind of, I don't think or I don't hope, but maybe somebody out there thinks that about me. I have no idea. <laughs> they do. But, I, absolutely, but, they would. Yeah, but it, I, think so, when you, I think it's when you retire and you've only just recently kind of stopped international competition, well, the Olympics anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. I think, you know, in years to come, it'll probably become more apparent for you, especially as your kids get older. Yeah, when, when I get dragged around for show and tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the yeah. medals have already gone in for show and tell a couple of times. <laughs> Olympic Day, June 23, you know, I get, I get uh, roped into that one. And my wife's also a school teacher and my older sister's a school teacher and a lot of my mates, <laughs> this is a school teacher. So I get dragged around to all the schools, which, which is great. And I love, I love sharing those moments and, and taking the medals in for them to see. Mm. Yeah, I, well, I can awesome. tell you. Kenny um, and Kerry, a story about that. Um, Kerry, the, the disc man, um, you know, um, covers for the medals in Sydney. And, you know, I guess it was leading into the 21st century. So they went futuristic. And I remember years ago going and doing a talk at a school and I've walked in with the cover. You know, it looks like a disc man. And back then, CDs and CD players were in vogue. I remember walking in with this medal up to the podium and the kids were just so disappointed when it was a gold medal because they thought <laughs> that I was going to give them a prize. It was hilarious. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a funny um, sort of story about what the kids' expectations and, and the fact that they were very disappointed that it wasn't a CD disc man. It was so funny. Yeah, it is funny what the medals do come in. In, in Atlanta, that was a beautiful box, a really engraved big wooden box, and then Sydney was this round thing. I don't think I ever got my medal to sit properly back in that Sydney round. No, you can never, never hold the ribbon properly. <laughs> um, guys, one piece of advice, you know, just keep it short, but one piece of advice, and I know there's not one, but maybe the the most important thing for you to kids looking up to you, because they are, Ken, um, who want to aspire to become Olympians and Olympic champions? R Rochelle's let it off each time. I reckon you can go again. <laughs> yeah, give him time to think, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, well, for me, honestly, it's all about work ethic. You just, you can't shortcut hard work. And as much as, you know, you like to have all the other fancy bits and, be the most talented and uh, player or athlete in the world, nothing substitutes hard work. And I think that's what I try and instill in aspiring athletes is don't shortcut your work. You've got to do the work to make it. And, and that's the advice I would present to any aspiring athletes that 
came to talk to me about their future prospects. Yeah, perfect. Thought of one, thought of one, Ken? <laughs> no, it, no, it does spark a, a little moment, but I'd always tell <laughs> I'd always tell kids to make training harder than the race. So it, yeah. it's along Rochelle's lines as well. Yes, good advice. You always make training harder than your race because the reflect the race is only a reflection of the training that you've done. Um, persistency, because it won't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, a good goal setting, sitting down with your coach uh, or sitting down with somebody else, and even if it's just by yourself in in your head, you've got to have those goals set in there and not just have yeah have them realistic as well so you have a short term goal a mid term and a long term goal and your long term yeah. goal was always the olympic games now because it's every 4 years it's a long time away sometimes but yeah you know, have realistic short term goals yeah. this week or this day i'm going to try and do this um but yeah it does it's not easy like Rochelle said it, yeah. you can't hide from the hard kilometers you can't yeah. hide from heavyweights and i guess the we used to always have a saying in training that some people didn't like, but don't be afraid to hurt yourself on a Monday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Hashtag that. Can yeah. someone hashtag that? Don't be afraid yeah. to hurt yourself on a Monday. Love it. Yeah, it's really good. And it's such a good point about training harder, making that preparation harder than what you face in competition. And I think that was very true of our team when we were successful for those eight years. We trained harder than what we expected at an Olympic Games. And that was very evident when we got there and um, we were probably the most uh, well-prepared mm. hockey team in the tournament and that just stood us in really good stead to, to win that gold medal. Amazing. Hey, guys, we can talk forever, but <laughs> we've got to do this one segment which I really love. It's the 60-second sprint. So I'm just going to, like, one of you at a time, I'm going to fire questions at you. We just want one-word answers or a one-sentence or something like that, but they're going to be, like, a lot of questions. It's the 60 seconds. Who wants to go first? You go, Kenny. <laughs> no, <that's right. laughs> All right. Let's see if we can get 60 seconds on the clock. You ready? Okay, Kenny, singles, doubles or fours? Uh, one of each. Oh. Cheap. <laughs> Did you the, the, the four because it's a it's a team event and you get to stand on the dice with your mates. The two man because you've got one single mate and then the single you're there for yourself and you prove how good you are. Okay, Luke, can we put another twenty seconds on the Sorry. clock? <laughs> anyway, um, did you sleep the night before your finals? Yes. No. Do I sleep or the girls don't? What did you visualize? Winning. Winning. What What I would do after the podium. Oh, cool. Would you say you were a good or bad loser? Bad. No, no, shh. You're, you're coming in a minute, Rochelle. Good. <laughs> good, good, good loser on cool. the outside. Okay. Uh, how often have you fallen out of your kayak? Multiple times and on a daily basis, the year of the Olympics. Oh, daily, cool. Oh, we'll just keep going. Um, your best Olympic village roommate? Uh, I stayed out of the village for a lot of them. Uh, so my coach, Jimmy Arns. What did you eat just before the race? Uh, wheat bix What did you eat straight after? Gold. Not much. Liquid diet. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Olympic tattoo? One. One. Okay. And are your medals still in mint condition or are they all grubby? uh they're good they're actually all clanged up at the moment the ribbons are pretty grubby ah and finally who's the most famous person that you've met besides us oh at an olympic games anywhere oh um kobe bryant rafael nadal uh roger federer uh Ooh. princess mary and her husband in Athens? At 2008, oh. um, yeah, the night before the opening ceremony, flag raising ceremony. Oh, cool. Yeah, they were in the village. Yeah, I know you I know you quickly got to go. Funniest story, though. Oh, that's uh, okay. One of the mates in the kayak team, he's gone up to Princess Mary, put, her arm, put his arm around her, turned around to, is it Prince Frederick, the husband? Yeah, yeah and turned around and goes, hey, mate, can you take a photo? 
and pass the camera to the French Frederick. Got a photo of his mistress and they go, yeah, no worries, cheers, and then took off. <laughs> Did he know who he was? I th- I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That was pretty funny. Uh, typical Aussie larrikins. Rochelle, now it's your turn. I, <laughs> I misinterpreted that. Sorry, Kerry. I thought I was after. All right. Yeah, That's get all right. it. It's good. It's good. All right. Your favourite roomie on tour? Juliet Haslam. You're the worst roomie on tour. No comment. <laughs> Song that pumped you up. Um, oh, there's so many. Uh, you put me on the spot here. Um, Elton John, I'm Still Standing. Oh, cool. Your hardest fought gold medal. Um, yes, Atlanta 1996. What did you do in the village in your downtime? Perved on everyone. <laughs> your all, the, all the very chiselled looking athletes, the, the, you know, from other countries and, you, you know, you've got the German men's hockey team and, yeah, some delightful specimens there. <laughs> we'll keep going. Um, your favourite Olympic moment apart from your own? Kathy Freeman, 400 metres, Sydney, 2000. What would you say is your unique superpower? Being able to block out um, any adversity so I can compartmentalise. Awesome, including pain. Yes. Olympic tattoo? On my lower leg, so the inside of my leg and then my ankle. And the most famous person that you've met? Muhammad Ali, 1996, in the food court. And I got an absolute shellacking from my teammates, um, my roommate, Juliet Haslam, because I said, don't take your camera, you won't need it. And sure enough, there's Muhammad Ali in the food court in 1996, and there weren't any smartphones around at the time. Oh, but what a memory. What a fantastic <laughs> memory. That's so cool. Cookie, you're back in the room. We're just going to finish off with any questions that were in the chat box that we do. Kenny's been on fire. He's been a keyboard warrior. He's been answering questions all the way through. I've got a couple of questions for you, Rochelle. Which is tougher, the pressure you place on yourself, the pressure of your teammates, or the pressure of your coach? The pressure I I place on myself, I just had high expectations. I think many athletes will say that because you're never satisfied. You're always searching for the perfect game, the perfect performance, and you never meet that expectation. So definitely internally the pressure I put on myself. Um, Another question for you, Rochelle. Hockey, the largest team sport in the Olympics. How do you maintain cohesiveness with that many personalities, even with specialised positions? Very tough. (laughs) There's a lot of different personalities that went through our groups. I tell you, we have very strong personalities and it's a case of um, having your rules, your guidelines that you need to follow, everyone being on the same page with those and then, you know, if you, you fall outside those um, rules, shall we say, then there's consequences for that and that's the best way to keep everyone together. And I think having open, honest conversations, we didn't all like each other but we knew we had a common goal and we're all there to do whatever we could for us individually and as a team to to make our team the most successful that we could be. Amazing, amazing. Um, Before I hand it back to Kerry, I just want to make sure, please make a donation to the Australian Sports Foundation. 16,000 clubs are in danger of shutting their doors in the next sort of six months. So please make sure you do that. Every donation counts and all donations are tax deductible. Click on the offers area, say thanks by making a donation today and support those community clubs with all those amazing athletes that are going to be the next Olympic stars. So back to you, Kerry. Yeah, I'll just reiterate that. The reason why we um, joined up with the Australian Sports Foundation as our charity partner is because we really want to support the community sport where we started and that's where the Olympic dreams of many kids begin. So I want to thank you both. I just wish tonight wasn't over. We could go for another hour. You guys are fantastic. And thank you both so much for for all your... um, Fantastic inspirational stories. Kenny, thanks for typing some answers in there too. That was really cool of you. Um, Yeah, and let's just watch your magic trick. 
Kenny's going <laughs> trick. Let's go. And <laughs> that, that was terrible. She's better in practice, bro. It worked so well the first time. <laughs> better before, in practice. Before you go, I just want to say tomorrow night we have my beautiful friend Natalie Cook on with Daniel Kowalski. Whoa. And we're going to explore what it's like to be a gay athlete in these days and these times um, with those two and obviously talk about their journeys at the Olympics as well. And until then, and I think you guys will really like this one, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. So reiterate it for both of you guys. Hey? You like that one? (laughs) Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow. See you later, everyone. Kenny, thanks for sharing. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.